Welcome back, everyone. This week, we're going to answer the question of if the top 25 worst performing stocks year to date went to zero, what are the implications for the KRE ETF? And the reason I'm positing the question in this fashion is because a lot of people seem concerned with banks going to zero, the worst case scenario, and how that might affect their holdings in the basket of names or in an ETF. And they say it's too risky, but, but they haven't done the math. So I've done some of the math for you. That's why we're asking that very specific question. And that's not even to say that that's the correct question to ask or the most important or the most relevant or, or so on and so forth, but it's a, a constricted, selected for biased question that doesn't address a lot of other what ifs or what abouts, which we're not going to address either. So we're going to focus on the question of if the top 25 worst performing banking stocks year to date went to zero, what's the impact on KRE? And here's a list of, or a chart of the worst performing ones. And interestingly enough, WAL, Western Alliance, did not make the cut. And the worst performing one here was down 42%. In disclaimer, this slide deck was created last week in beginning of the week. So this information is somewhat outdated. For instance, PacWest, you see in the left side is down 75%. But in reality, they're currently down, I don't know, call it 65%. So there's been some rebound in the market over the last week. So keep that in mind and take that into consideration. But Western Alliance didn't make it, and, and barely, because I think it was down as of this around 40 or 41%. So it almost missed the top 25. So you might have seen charts like this floating around. So before we jump into <clears throat> the implications of the top 25 worst performers going to zero, I want to address three things briefly that are affecting the banking stocks, in case you're unaware. So you might see a chart like this floating around, and you need to be cognizant of any chart you ever see and ask yourself, what is it not showing me? And what relevance is what not being shown well relevant? And for instance, this chart only includes banks with at least $50 billion in assets at the end of 2022, which means that PacWest, for instance, the most popular stock in the markets right now, it, well, most pop, NVIDIA is the most popular perhaps, but the most popular banking stock in the markets that's chronically being discussed and examined didn't even make the list. So the three things. The first thing is uninsured share of customer deposits. The second thing is common equity tier one capital ratio adjusted for unrealized losses on securities. And then the, other th the third thing is bank deposits. And now more pertinently is the quarter over quarter change in core bank deposits and how much that has changed one way or the other, good, bad, less bad. Because if it's less bad and it was expected to be worse then the stock could actually go up as a consequence because there was a mismatch between reality and expectation. So you always have to factor that in. But those are the three things affecting matters. So what would happen if all 25 of these went to zero? Now, of course, that would presume that something has happened catastrophically in the banking sector that would have implications and ripples throughout the other whole. I think KRE has 143, <clears throat> we'll call it roughly 145 holdings. So just, and, and only 17 of these are listed in KRE. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but, but you have to, okay, so 145 minus 17 is 138. One twenty eight. And so obviously that kind of news, that kind of a event headline 
would probably cause that un the, the other 128 banking stocks to also probably not look too well. But yet again, we're not, we're not addressing any of that. Just the, the top 25 worst, there's, I believe, around 400, 450 publicly traded banks, around, you know, 4,000, 4,500 banks altogether, FDIC, chartered banks. So, so if the worst 25 performers went to zero and the other 400 plus did their thing and kept trucking along, what would that look like? So what I did <clears throat> is I went into KRE, went to the website, all the links to all this stuff be in the description. And in the far right hand column of each one of these names, you'll see for instance, Pac West Bancorp 0.874109. That's the percentage of weighting in the KRE. And I did that for all of the top 25 worst performers, but eight of them were in KRE. And I, I'm not just going to say a bunch of letters. So interestingly enough, Key Corp wasn't in there. And then Comerica wasn't in KRE. So those are two that you might be somewhat familiar with hearing in the news or reading about. These other ones weren't in there. Some of them are like $120 million market. Ca I'm, they're, they're small, but the Key Corp and the Comerica are two that you might be familiar with that didn't make it. So that gives us only 17, but we're going to add in Western Alliance, WAL, because it wasn't included and it is relevant, both because it's in KRE and because it's probably the most or second most talked about regional bank stock. So if you add all of these up at their weight, with their weightings, all 17, you come out to 10.11%. We'll call it 10%. And then if you add in Western Alliance, because you might as well, that's 12.8%. And PacWest and Western Alliance, the, the two main headline names make up collectively 3.44%. So all else being equal, if 17 of the top 25 worst performing stocks went to zero, KRE would be down 12.8%. Now, that actually kind of sounded not inconsequential, but smaller than what I initially thought upon a cursory glance. So if 17 of them went down to zero, KRE would lose, I don't want to say only, but only 12.8%. Now, the top 10 holdings make up 30.39%. And the largest holding in KRE is New York Community Bancorp at 5.43%. And then there's a couple of three percenters and then two percenters and, and it just goes down from there. And Western Alliance is in the top 10 at 2.57%. So you know that name. Then you know Zion, but that's been in the name. That's at 2.46%. So we're talking 5% roughly of if Zion and Western Alliance went under so it's, it's not nearly as a detrimental move as what you might think. The shoe could drop for a couple of more companies. You know, say <clears throat> PacWest and Western Alliance go under and, and <clears throat> is what it is. And then maybe things stop. But it's not as large of a magnitude issue as you might initially upon first blush think. Now... There's two primary regional bank ETFs. That's the KRE and the IAT. Now I'm not discussing IAT today, even though I, I hold a position in both of these names, they're, they're different. IAT has, uh, it's like 40, we'll just call it roughly 40 stocks in it. And it has a much heavier weighting in its top 10 names. And its largest position is roughly 15%. So what I want to note here in this chart is that because, so, so now we know if 17 
or really 18 of the top 26 worst performing stocks went to zero, KRE would be down a measly 12%. Measly to me because, I mean, in my portfolio, I have names that move 12% in a day. So that if it fell 12%, I'd be like, okay, that like that's completely expected in my portfolio. And it, it wouldn't happen suddenly, I wouldn't suspect either. So what I wanted to note is that since inception, because they both started around June of 2006, they've tracked roughly in line with one another. I, I believe if this is a max chart, if I believe if you pull up a five year chart, there's like a 1% difference between the two. And IAT pays a higher dividend yield than KRE. I, I got in the KRE at like 4.01%. I got in the IAT at 4.69%. So, I mean, it's meaningful. And as IAT has a slightly higher expense ratio, I think 0.39% as opposed to KRE at 0.35%. And But what I'm trying to demonstrate in this chart is... They, they track roughly in line with one another. And, and that's always worth remembering when diving into a particular sector or industry or sub-industry is how do they track. Like, if, if you look at copper and you look at Freeport MacMoran and then you look at COPX, C-O-P-X, the ETF, and then if you go back long enough FCX, Freeport, has outperformed COPX. But in the last few years, they've tracked practically in line with one another, and COPX offers a 2% dividend, while Freeport offers like a 0.8% dividend. So you, you always need to do that and remember that. And unless you just like the name and you don't care and you don't want a basket, but, but sometimes even names track each other so well. The interesting thing, and this kind of emphasizes counter cyclical investing and the, the whole buy when there's blood in the streets trope that everybody's beaten to death and misappropriated, is if you bought during the inception, now, by the way, this is IAT, KRE did not offer this or I did not see it. So, and since they've tracked perfect, well, pretty much in line, <clears throat> it's the same difference as far as I'm concerned. If you bought into it when it, at inception, June 2016, you would have sat through, uh, according to this chart, a 74% drawdown from 2000, June 2006 to March 2009, you would have lost 74% of your money. But here's the interesting thing. If you held long enough, all the way to January of 2022, you would have made 100% on your money. So even after a 75% drawdown, like keep this in mind, people. If, if you have conviction in something you buy, like real conviction, not a speculative small position you've scaled into as, as a little teaser feeler position. And, and I'm, if you have conviction in something and it falls 25, 50%, like you need to understand, like that's part and parcel for multi-X returns, but even for a 100% return. Of course, it's also theoretically a good way to go to zero. So I'm mean, asking anybody who owns many of the pump and dump stocks of the last few years. Ask anyone who owns SoFi. It's, it's, I don't know, what is it trading at? $7 a few weeks ago. So you would have made 100% on your money, which means you would have annualized 6.25% a year. And and then, within a year and five months from being up 100%, you would now be down 2%, which is why there's times to buy these things and there's times not. I don't understand how anybody thought that these were really a good buy in the last five years. I mean, you could say in retrospect, how would you know? But, I mean, you just look at a chart. You know, is it is that the top section or the bottom section of, of the band? Do you think it's going to break out? I mean... There's certain things like Ken Ross. You just look at the Ken Ross chart. Look at natural gas chart. When is the time to buy? When, when it's way up there or, or when it's way down there? 
I, you kind of got to think that way. I know it's reductionistic and oversimplifying matters, but you really do have to think that way. So then if you look at this chart, you say, okay, where would you buy? Would, would you, you know, d up there or down there? I mean, I don't know. So the S&P, as I said, it's under, or unless I didn't, the S&P clearly is outperformed because year to date, as of May 22nd, the S&P from that inception time, s and is up 224%. So during January of 2022, it would have been up even more. So here KRE and IAT is, is down from 2006. And s and is up 224%, which is why there's tactical times to play these names and tactical times, well, not to play the names. And because had you bought KRE, if you could time it perfectly at the bottom, that's a different story. But of course, we're drawing our lines and measurements very specifically. So enough said on that. So I want to show you some poor market advertisement. Why IAT? And here's the, this is kind of a gripe that's beside the point, and then we'll, we'll get over this and <clears throat> move on of a few things, price to book, price of cash flow, and stuff like that at KRE. But why IAT? I, I just couldn't not include this. So exposure to small and mid-sized U.S. banks. Number two, targeted access to domestic regional bank stocks. Number three, used to express a sector view. So what they just did in their advertisement is say, these are reasons why you should buy KRE. They did not differentiate themselves at all. And I actually call this, you know, the, the why did you marry her problem, which is, you know, you ask someone, why did you marry someone? And then they say, well, they're smart and they're funny and they're considerate. And it's like, yeah, but you have to keep constant your comparisons and control for the variables which is to say that there are millions of smart, considerate, funny people or whatever three attributes I listed. Like there's millions of them. So why her? Why that one specifically? And then there's, and what's interesting if you play this game, well, it requires you to be intellectually honest and creative, which stops most people right there because, well, the truth packs a punch, let's just say. And, and then you start coming across regions like, it was convenient, or I was peeking out of the sexual dating marketplace and as a consequence, I had to settle for someone and I thought that she would be the best I could do before I started deteriorating in older age. Or I was necessitous and lacked optionality, so that's why. Or because she comes from a similar socio-economic demographic background. See, or, or because, you know, I'm, I'm unhealthy and stupid and she's unhealthy and stupid and I couldn't get anyone better than my version of myself because who would want my, you know, who would want me? So I'd have to meet someone or get with someone as, as low down on the, the, the dating marketplace as myself. Like those are all, everything I just said are reasons, including the funny, attractive, considerate, and you know, whatever, smart. And, but what about all these other reasons? Now, no one wants to talk about those other reasons. So, so they, they lie and they ignore it in this willful blindness. And, and this is all relevant, actually, both for if you plan on selecting a, a partner. And the same difference can go along with why a woman got with a guy. So let's not play the sexist card here. So you have to cite all the reasons, at least to yourself. I'm not saying make a checklist and discuss it with people. But you have to know the reasons why you're getting involved with something whether that be a person or whether that be a company or whether that be an ETF holding a basket of companies. And you don't want to just say the flattering ones, the confirmation bias ones, the ones that validate you and make you feel good about yourself. You have to provide as many reasons as possible 
because in doing so, you might discover inconsistencies and incongruencies in the story that you're trying to create. And you also have to remember that there's alternative considerations. In the dating market, there's a, a, a phenomenon called the secretary problem, which is each partner you date, once you break up with them, you can't date them again. So at first, you're young and spoiled for choice and naive and optimistic. And so you just start churning through partners because you're like, why settle for that? Why settle for that? I can do better. I can do better. I'm still developing and growing and going to school and college and getting promotions and nicer cars. And I bought a house. You know, you, you come up with all these reasons that, that upgrade you and level you up in the world. But at some point, number one, if, if you don't understand the base rate in the market, then, then you're bound to accidentally throw away a jewel because you didn't realize it was a jewel and all you were thinking was I can do better without actually taking into consideration what you had. That's called, you know, kind of getting greedy and you can do the same thing in stocks. You know, maybe you've been fine with a Cirrus Logic or a Skyworks or, or an AMD and, and now you're checking out the the NVIDIAs of the world and, you, and all you can think of is I, I should have gotten the NVIDIA, but you're doing just well enough or in the SMH, the Semiconductor ETF. You, you, you would still be doing quite well and be just as happy. That, that's a, a distinction bias, I believe is what it's called. And the only reason you know you're not as happy is because somehow the alternative counterfactual world is also playing out to you in real time. It's like if I give you an apple and you eat it and you were really satisfied, but then I put that apple on the tail saying a counterfactual world and then gave you this perfect shaped shiny firm apple that's well polished and everything ready for a photo shoot and i give you that apple and you eat that apple and then i say how would you feel about that apple sitting on the table and you would say you like it less but the fact of the matter is is that you actually enjoyed them the same i mean go google it distinction bias it's it's quite a fascinating phenomenon that best buy or oh, I shouldn't name drop, but uh, marketing places that sell goods know, know that you'll do this. So they take advantage of you, which, which falls into a much, I've completely gone off the rails, I apologize. But this goes into a much broader understanding of your being and the self-actualization that markets should bring about on you if you aren't already self-actualized because you realize that the same things that apply in markets are transferable to life in general on many occasions. So back to the distinction bias, if there's two TVs for sale, they're both better than the TV you currently have. The TV on the left is a $500 TV and you know, 4K high pixel resolution, just awesome good stuff, better than your TV by far. You honestly don't know what to do with this TV. It has so many awesome options and so on and so forth. And, and you would be great just buying that TV, but then on the TV on the right, it has all those things plus a few other perks and even high, you know, 8K and higher pixelation and just all this other stuff. And it's $800 and then you're like, wow. And what you do is you start comparing not your personal satisfaction with the interaction of the TV because there's actually a maximum effective dose of enjoyment that you'll derive from the TV in part based upon your expectations effect. But you start comparing the TVs to each other instead of to you. It's like if you own a beat up crappy car and you go out and buy a brand new car, You'd be, if, if you're driving a 1995 car and you go buy a 2023 anything, it will be worlds better than what you drive. It'll be much more quiet. You start reading reports on, on road noise and, and you're like, oh, you know, some people complain about the road noise on this car. Like, trust me, the road noise will be much less than whatever you're driving and have experience. Oh, well, some people didn't think they had a good balance between the bass and the treble. Yet again, its stereo will be far superior to yours. And maybe that's a $25,000 base model car. Some, yeah, I don't know, 
um, Kia or something. And, and then you start looking at, well, but I could buy this new Toyota Camry for thirty-five dollars or $40,000. And it's like, you wouldn't be wise enough to appreciate the difference between the two. In some sense, you're on the left end of the curve of the Dunning-Kruger due to your anecdotal experience of cars. Like, you can't appreciate the fine wine if it's just all alcohol to you. So, same thing with IAT. Back, back to this piece, because I went on much longer than I thought I was going to on that. And, but it's all relevant, so whatever. So back to IAT. They didn't differentiate. If you've gone through the work to say, I want to buy banks, I'm looking at regional banks, let me go to iShares website and see what they have to offer me. I would think at that point you're an experienced enough trader that these three points as to why I, you should buy IAT, number one, are, are already obvious to you. And like, it doesn't help anything. So get that crap out of the way. So KRE over IAT, it's trading at a cheaper price to book. This 0.83, it's higher than that now. Like I said, this was done roughly a week ago. Number of holdings, more diversified. So that can help you, that can hurt you, and, and it can help and hurt you. Price to earnings ratio, roughly six and a half. So six and a half PE, trading at 15% discount to book. It has the average weighted market cap of the companies in is $6 billion. So that's not tiny. It's not huge either. Look what they did with GME when it was at $2 billion, ran it up to $20 plus billion. So a lot of movement can come from a $6 billion company. But they, they also have a higher market cap, assets under management versus IAT. And it also has higher trading volume and therefore more liquidity than KRE. So those are also bonuses as to why KRE the gross expense ratio, like I said, is 0.35%. It's yielding now below a 4% dividend yield. Like I said, when I got it, it was 4% dividend yield. And, and that's that. So I, got, I went on too long with that tangent that I think was worthwhile because I like to talk that way and I might talk more that way in the upcoming future because that's how I talk. And... Here's my positions, nothing changed, stacking cash. I'm at 25% cash right now. Problem with that is <clears throat> more cash I get, the more outperformance my names have to do in order for me to outperform my benchmark. So that's going to be a problem. So I suspect as I build cash, I'm gonna start underperforming my benchmark, at least in the interim. But if that's at the benefit of longer term gains, being able to capitalize on things, so be it, I'm quite torn as to where the market's going. I actually think the market's going up, but man, I'm bearish. So <laughs> I, I, I'm all over the place. I, I do not have any conviction either way. And, and so I still have to participate because I can't underperform for too long, but don't get carried away and think that underperforming for a month or two is the end of the world. It is if you're a fund manager and you have a bunch of foolish, neurotic, short-sighted, myopic, immediate gratification, non-volatility handling limited partners, but I don't. So that's actually an edge I have in the market. And uranium was actually looking good, but it, it's kind of done whatever. And like I said, like in, I mean, in the last video or the one before, uranium's a long game. It's all long games. None, none of these are immediate gratifying names. So Ken Ross... It's falling, gold's falling, everybody. Just pull up a chart of Kinross on a daily candlestick chart. Like that thing went dumb up. And and I was giving much of it back. And yeah, like what, what would you expect? Like look at the chart. But you know, a bunch of people chased it because of the whole banking thing. And now they're giving it back. And I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if it goes into the red on me eventually and so be it if it goes cheap enough I'll buy more if if you recall I actually bought Kinross before the whole banking thing and, and I kind of wanted to sell it 
because it went up ridiculously quick and a good profit. But I didn't buy it at all because of the whole banking thing. That, that kind of was the icing on the cake. And it's like, do, do you sell and take short-term profits on, on a name that... And the answer was no. So, but it really sucks to see something go up 30% to then eventually be down 10 or 20% on. But whatever, I mean, is what it is. It's the name of the game. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for watching. Hope this video was helpful. And until next time.